you so much for coming um, to this event at such short notice. My name is Olesa Kromuchuk, I'm the director of the Ukrainian Institute London. Uh, we are a charity that is working to strengthen Ukraine's voice in the UK and beyond. And uh, we have really faced the challenge over the last 10 or 11 days because we're quite a small charity and just to give you an idea of what it's been like. Um, our traffic, our online traffic increased by 3,000% since Putin attacked Ukraine. Um, so thank you for being here, thank you for reading our um, uh, posts online, thank you for helping us if you can. I know all of our efforts now go to humanitarian aid and immediate concerns in Ukraine, uh, but if you're able to support Ukrainian Institute London, we'll be extremely grateful because we also obviously need to keep functioning and organizing events such as the one today. And it is my great pleasure to introduce the panel of speakers that you will hear uh, from today. Um, the uh, discussion will be moderated by Svetlana Perkalo, a trustee of the Ukrainian Institute London and a writer and former journalist. And um, we'll have two excellent speakers, Dr. Aura Sabadus, senior journalist specializing in energy markets of Ukraine and Black Sea countries. And some of you might have already heard her as part of our discussion. Uh, how many weeks ago? I don't even remember. It's all one cooler now. A few weeks ago when we discussed the importance of stopping Nord Stream, Nord Stream 2, um, which Aura advocated for, and luckily that has happened. Uh, and we also have Karina Luchinkina, is that right? Um, a former board member of the company supervising Ukraine's gas transmission system operator. So very knowledgeable speakers, and I really hope we'll be able to discuss how Europe can sever its dependence on Russian gas to save Ukraine. Thank you very much, Alessa, and thank you for introducing uh, all of the speakers, usually the moderator for us, but um, I think we, uh, we're all, we all um, a little bit um, pulled to different directions now, and I uh, first of all apologize for looking at my phone. I'm not even reading the news about the, uh, the war, I'm just, uh, my mother is crossing the Polish border uh, right now, and uh, you know, if she gets stuck with something, I, I kind of want to pick up the phone. Um, but that, that aside, I think we, uh, we all know what's happening in Ukraine because everybody is reading the news non-stop and now we have a discussion about uh, a very important um, aspect of this, uh, of this situation which is Europe's reliance on Russian gas and that is not only a question of uh, political reluctance of Europe or at least a former reluctance to support Ukraine in this conflict. It is a question of, um, of what happens and how to reduce it, I think. Uh, we, all, we all know that there is a political will in Europe, in the European Union, and has been for a while to reduce this reliance after the conflict in, uh, in Ukraine, after the war started in 2014. Some moves were made to start reducing this reliance, previously moves were made also to start reducing this reliance, and then somehow it didn't quite get to, uh, to a very uh, strong result. So now we have a situation where this needs to be uh, done urgently and um, and it is, it is a big scary topic for a lot of not just politicians uh, but citizens and voters in the European Union and in the UK. Um, and I'd like to start this discussion with uh, from the end, as it were. So well, there is this fear that Russian gas will disappear and um, everything will plunge into darkness and we won't know what to do and there will be uh, looting and, and horrors on the streets of Europe. Um, and I'd like to address that to start with. So what happens if a hypothetical scenario where all of the gas storages run out of Russian gas tomorrow, what, and the uh, pipelines are blown up by Putin, or whatever the situation, so what happens if all of the Russian gas supplies are cut off right now? Will there be darkness, or will there be not really darkness? Aura, yeah. can, you, can you start to sort of... <coughs> yes. I know it's hypothetical, <laughs> but... I can, I can. <laughs> Doomsday scenario really doesn't happen. But thank you very much, by the way, for introducing the uh, topic and thank you to the organizers for organizing this event in very short notice. But I'd like to give you a bit of a broader perspective. And I, we need to separate this story into uh, two parts. So there's the Eastern European and the Ukrainian side angle, which is absolutely critical, and then there's the Western European side, and I'll get to that later on. But right now, the situation is that uh, the whole infrastructure. You know, obviously, the, the biggest 
the biggest issue right now is, is the victims, the casualties, the people who die and are injured. But uh, second, secondary to that, it's also a risk to infrastructure. And we're talking here two issues. Number one, gas, which, as you said, is absolutely critical. Um, and um, I will explain why it's critical. And then electricity. And um, many of you may have been following stories in the press that, about uh, Russian troops attacking, specifically targeting uh, nuclear power plants. Um, they controlled Chernobyl, um, and there were reports that one of the, uh, new, uh, the spent nuclear storage facilities was, was targeted, and that uh, some, there was some radioactive activity. Uh, the International Energy Agency, uh, for, uh, Atomic Energy Agency, is monitoring the situation. Um, the second largest, um, sorry, the, the, Europe's largest nuclear power plant is that the nuclear power plant, which is absolutely huge, it's big, it's the biggest in Europe, uh, was also under attack. There was a fire and they deliberately attacked it. Um, fortunately, if I can say so, they hit the training center, they didn't hit the one of the reactors because it would have been an absolute disaster. <coughs> and the fire was extinguished and now they are very close. Last time I checked earlier this morning they were about 35 kilometers away from a third nuclear power plant in the region, um, which, um, which uh, again they, they would like to control. The reason why they would like to control, and again, I, that there are so many things that we are all following but you need to be aware of, is that Right now, Ukraine is operating in complete isolation from any other grids. In, in normal situations, all countries are connected to, to lines uh, with other countries. But Ukraine was, is supposed or is expecting to connect with the European grid from next year. And as part of that, uh, they uh, decided to unplug from all the grids so on, the, on the eastern side, Russia and Belarus, and on the western side, from Slovakia, Poland and uh, Romania. Uh, sorry, Hungary, Slovakia and Romania. Uh, and they unplugged four hours before the Russians attacked on the 24th of February. Uh, so that was lucky and the, Euro of yeah, the European Union already said that they will accelerate the uh, exactly. connection to the grid. Exactly. Um, I know that the ambassador, Ukrainian ambassador met with the Secretary of Energy on Saturday mm -hmm. and um, whatever the Ukrainian side asked they were promised, so I don't know what they Absolutely, are but... Uh, uh, for the UK it's maybe not so relevant because... No, no, for the um, UK it's, it's not relevant, but the problem is uh, they, they are, these people working at the uh, transmission system operating for electricity in Ukraine are absolute heroes because it's already very difficult to maintain a, 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 a whole system in isolation, let alone under raining bombs. Um, so let's let's go back to gas. I mean, the the, uh, the this well, the yeah this this, this, this topic connected. this topic is just so big and there's just so many so uh, things. And just speaking, speaking of gas and destruction, uh, you know that the gas pipeline was hit in 15 cities where yes. cut off from uh, gas. And that's another to... thing. Um, but yes, so gas. What is gas? So, uh, so the reason the, the reason why I started with this is because if these nuclear power plants go, then they will, the Ukrainian the Ukrainian system needs to switch to gas. From, next, from this week. So if the second power plant is connect, is, is falls under control, a Russian control, then there is a bad need to switch to gas. So now I, I finally come back to your question about gas, and apologies, it was a bit long. It just, uh, let, let me just uh, re rephrase it, because we, we sort of asked to uh, talk about Europe's reliance on gas, and Ukraine was the start of broader Europe, but um, um, yeah, so. Uh, so they they are expecting to switch to gas in order to balance the system. Um, if you have a small idea of how, how electricity system works, it needs to be working at the same frequency. Any ups and downs in frequencies could actually uh, create big problems. So if these nuclear power plants go, then they will have to switch existing power plants that can operate on gas, they will have to switch to gas. And now we're coming to this bigger doomsday scenario where the gas is switched off. So what is going to happen? The gas could be switched off in a couple of scenarios. Number one, the pipelines are attacked, um, and I'm talking here the system in Ukraine. Um, and number two, Russia deliberately cuts the gas, um, either in retaliation for more sanctions, uh, or um, in order to create problems, knowing full well that Ukraine will depend on gas uh, 
even more going from next week if more power plants fall under under Russian uh, control. Now, if the pipelines are attacked, and you just mentioned this, this is the pipeline that this, um, just just before we, we we started speaking, I got the text message to say that the pipeline near Mariupol was attacked. Uh, and there was a big uh, explosion. Luckily, this pipeline, or if I can say so, luckily, I do, I do apologize if the, the language is not quite right, but if, uh, you know, it is what it is. This, this pipeline actually is a lifeline to Mariupol, and we all know that Mariupol right now is under severe attack, and it's, it's, it's a huge risk. Um, but the transit pipeline, so we we're talking here really huge systems, so the Ukrainian transmission system. Is, is the most powerful in Europe, um, and it has been. It, it can incredibly well um, shift the gas from one side to the other of the pipeline because it's so big, so complex. It has storage facilities. Uh, it was built in mind with flexibility. So, so thanks to that, if if there is a problem to one of the pipelines, the gas can be moved to a different side of the pipeline. So it's 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 possible. But that's in a scenario where then we have damage. But if the gas stops completely, then the whole of Eastern Europe is going to experience problems. Not just because, not not just Ukraine, um, which, as um, as Vitlana said, Ukraine stopped buying gas from Russia in 2015. Uh, but some of this gas that goes to Europe is reversed. So you know, the, the Ukraine transits the gas to Slovakia, Poland, and Hungary. Uh, but once the gas enters these countries, it comes back into Ukraine as European gas, because that's the beauty of European regulations. So what um, we remember some time ago, 2006, the Russia stopped the transit of gas. So there were there were some blackouts and, and some issues, and also it happened in the winter because somehow they like doing it in the winter when it hurts. Uh, but let's say this gas finishes on the Ukrainian border onwards westwards, Europe, European Union plus maybe UK, which is not that bad. Uh, what happens in the European Union? Does it mean that people will uh, just sort of civilization disappears overnight? Does it mean shortages? And what is the stability of the EU system to uh, withstand such a thing uh, in case and um, uh, in case there's a political need for European leaders to stop buying Russian gas? Uh, I think we probably need to separate. I think the question is, if something happens to Ukrainian pipelines, it's one scenario. If Nord Stream 1 is stopped, it's a different scenario. Exactly. So because gas enters Europe from different directions, there are different interconnectors. How important working. is Russian gas for the survival of EU, EU as So as it contributes moment. about 40% of EU gas. So it's not okay. only supply of gas in European markets. In European markets, we have gas storages which already has gas. Yeah, yeah, which comes in LNG. It comes from uh, Algeria. It comes from kind of other markets. Yeah, so it's not only uh, Ukrainian gas right. or gas that via Ukraine or via Nord Stream One. Yeah, so uh, most dependent countries on Russian gas that either enters through Ukraine or through Nord Stream uh, One. It's uh, and then also the third stream like in other pipelines. Yeah. yeah? Uh, primarily Central and Eastern European countries, so some countries have 100% dependency on Russian gas, and some countries don't have any. Yeah? Which, so, country, which country has 100%? Like Finland, for example, okay. like uh, Slovakia, Moldova. 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 Yeah? So some of the nearest countries to Ukraine and to the kind of borders, that they have most dependency on Russian gas. So countries like Portugal doesn't have any. Yeah? Right. Yeah? So oh, but yeah. What, what happens then? Kind of gas enters Europe from different directions, and then there are different interconnectors in Europe that make gas move around European systems. So in some cases, these interconnectors are pretty effective, and in some cases, that probably kind of it would be much more, more difficult to get the gas from Portugal to Finland. Yeah. So European so, system, and it's um, I didn't think to ask for a projector, but. Um, uh, we are where we are. European system is interconnected except in some cases. So let's say the EU decides to stop buying Russian gas and just run a little bit on its reserves um, as a sanction or for security um, issues or for any other reason. Uh, what is the next measure to uh, replace this gas? So uh, let's talk about LNG terminals and uh, anything else. Okay. So what is the most so quickest thing that Europe can so as, uh, as Karina said, we, we need to remember that 
th these are two scenarios. So Russia supplies Europe via four corridors. One is Ukraine, the other one is the so-called Turk Stream Corridor, which comes with brings gas from Russia to southern Europe and via Turkey. But then we have Nord Stream 1, which is the pipeline that links uh, Russia to Germany via the Baltic Sea. And then there is the, the so-called Yamal pipeline. Yeah. Um, so this is this is this is uh, this is um, um, sorry. This was a transmogram, so not updated. But right. So this is the Ukrainian transit system. Then we have um, we have Nord Stream One coming from here, actually, but going way to Germany. Then we have Turk Stream going by the Black Sea. Bulgaria, Serbia, Hungary, and then the Yamal pipeline, which links um, Russia from here, it goes through Belarus, Poland, and enters Germany. So there is also LNG terminals, which and, and then we have the LNG the terminals in in Spain, in Portugal, in France, in Belgium, Holland, uh, the UK, quite a few, Italy, Greece, um, Croatia, Lithuania. Uh, Turkey and um, Poland. Uh, so, so, so in case Russian gas disappears magically overnight for whatever reason, well, it doesn't. And, and again, I don't like. Well, let's let's just uh, <laughs> but let me, that, ladies, please <laughs> uh, in, indulge my indulge my fantasy. Uh, so, <laughs> for, if for whatever reason there's a magical uh, situation where we all turn off the low Lord Voldemort or Harry Potter magically away Russian gas. Um, there, is there enough LNG terminals in Europe to uh, replace that supply in the short term? I realize there will be cost implications, but uh, in principle, is there enough infrastructure in the European Union plus the UK to get more expensive but still LNG uh, gas supplies to, from Qatar, from wherever, from the United States? Yeah, the Western Europe is in a very comfortable position. It has all these terminals, which I mentioned. It has Norwegian gas, a lot of gas from Norway coming in. The UK has British gas. Uh, there are also interconnectors between the UK and continental Europe, so gas can flow both ways, either from continental Europe to the UK or backwards. Um, there is also, as you said, Algerian gas, Libyan gas coming in. Um, so, Western Europe is in a comfortable situation. In fact, in the first two months of the year, we saw that LNG was the top supplier of gas to Europe. About 400 million cubic meters of gas were coming in, followed by about 300 million cubic meters of Norwegian gas. Is that and, a month? Uh, per day. Sorry. Per day. Okay. And um, Russian gas came in third, a distant third, um, to, to Europe. Um, Russian LNG or Russian No, no, energy? Russian pipeline gas coming right. through, through these pipelines that I mentioned. So Nord Stream 1, Ukraine mm. and... Um, so that is already in... Uh, what, what's the time period? Uh, January and February of and this year. Of this year. And uh, we, LNG were at record, record high levels. Uh, and the biggest supplier was uh, the US. Uh, so so I, I have some uh, some numbers here, I don't know if this is clearly visible, but this shows the increase in LNG supplies yes, um, in January this year, yeah. when Russia started producing its supply to the European Union already. No, but I think it's a bit, you kind of, I need to also look at this LNG supplies in the context of the prices. So typically LNG is more expensive than yes. pipeline gas, but pipeline gas also multiplied four times since four to six times since the beginning uh, of the, well, it's kind of, it basically curved yeah. went like this. So more kind of things happening with the war, higher prices for pipelines will be. And therefore, that kind of, that connection between LNG prices and pipeline prices, that kind of, uh, doesn't, kind of doesn't work price comparison. Then pipeline gas becomes a lot more kind of expensive. So how much, at the moment, let's say, if I were to, to start thinking, do I want a pipeline or do I want LNG? Oh, there are kind of traders who are kind of analyzing it. Who kind of it's, it's not that much of a price difference, is that what you're saying? Well, I mean, it depends on the contracts. We, we can't really, because uh, pipeline, pipeline is, can be, and I don't want to bore you with too complex uh, <laughs> details, or contractual details, but typically the, the gas can be priced off oil, um, so 
you know, the, if the price of oil goes up, that increase in the oil price is reflected within the gas price after three months, six months, nine, nine months, depending on, on the contractual terms. Or it can be price of circle hubs, and these are basically markets um, you know, where, where the gas is traded by the yeah. you and I trade, yeah. and, and there is a price. So both um, LNG can also be priced of, of oil, and there are, there are some contractual terms. Um, so it's not really that clear cut. But, but Karina is absolutely right. The price of gas has increased. We are now talking absolute records. And you will feel it come 1st of April, uh, even here in the UK. Yeah. Um, that is an important uh, thing point, I think, here for, for the UK, because UK is not relying on Russian gas, it's 5% of the total gas supply, but the gas, because of the switch to the new pricing model, the price is going to increase, what, two, three times or something? Something horrible, and it will be at the time when some sanctions are possibly going to be discussed. Um, and I, I fear that this is going to be linked with the, in people's minds with the issue of Ukraine, even though it has nothing to do with it. No, no, the, the price increase has been there for, for a year now, for more than a year. We've seen prices increasing uh, incrementally, and uh, right now it's just the climax of prices. We're talking um, you know, more yeah. than $2,000 per thousand per, per thousand cubic meter, which is Karina so said for four, six times higher than the long-term long average price. Right, so um, I think I more or less got an answer to my uh, original question, which is ap apocalypse is not going to happen because the European system more or less is interconnected enough to replace the Russian pipeline gas with LNG. LNG prices and the pipeline gas prices are not different enough to collapse any economies. Uh, that is obviously a short-term solution, and there will be maybe some. Can I just kind of say a little bit, kind of summarize in slightly kind of two different tab? If you look at all the discussions among European experts, and kind of, you see I'm kind of wearing kind of blue and yellow, which kind of shows perhaps kind of my allegiances in the case, and I'm Ukrainian by background, and my family is in kind of war zones. So obviously, I would say kind of yeah, Europe will kind of survive, and everything kind of will be fine. But if you kind of see what European experts are uh, saying now about what would happen if there is disruption of Russian gas. People are not talking about that there will be troubles in the next, this year. They're not even talking about troubles being potentially next year. They're talking about troubles being in 2023. So this is this kind of, this is the answer kind of to your question. In short term, there is no expectation that there will be really big impact on the European market of gas. So that's, that's the view, if you kind of read kind of anything kind of from Economist to Wall Street Journal to Financial Times, this is kind of what European kind of experts are saying. Walter Bowles, who was my kind of fellow board member in the main gas pipelines of Ukraine, just kind of today kind of gave interview to Austrian uh, TV station, and Austria is nearly 100% dependent on Russian gas, and he said that actually kind of switching kind of gas um, to uh, Russian gas would actually help to uh, perhaps kind of stop uh, the war and stop the uh, um, uh, shooting. So, and this is his respected kind of European energy expert. I'm not putting kind of words yeah. in the mouth of European expert. This is what consensus of European experts are at the moment. Um, the, the, well, the, that is interesting because, of course, the uh, part of the reason this topic is. Uh, necessary to discuss today, uh, we are here today rather than uh, in Trafalgar Square protesting, is it is important from the point of view of sanctions as well, the willingness of uh, European leaders to consider stopping buying Russian uh, oil and gas, and uh, we probably don't have uh, a lot of time for oil, but gas. Um, depends on how damaging this will be to, uh, to their societies and economies. So if, uh, if experts are saying that this is in principle possible, then I'd like to discuss how. So let's say Austria, 100% depends on Russian gas. Is that because there is no other gas that is supplied to it, or is it because it's locked into contracts with Gazprom, um, and it just has to legally, or whatever, for whatever other reason, or because Gazprom owns the storages in Austria, buy Russian gas, but if it couldn't buy Russian gas, can it buy some other gas? I think the question is here, it's just not kind of, I think if we start discussing, well, is this is kind of Austrian case, or what about Slovakia, what about the small region here and there? I think let's just kind of, what kind of we need to kind of discuss, it's the principle. 
one kind of Europe might not have a choice, yeah? And this is kind of what kind of Aura mentioned before, with all this kind of blowing up of pipelines, etc. People really kind of what was a remote risk possibility. You mean, you mean, no, can I just you the, might not have a choice other than let me just no, I just Please, I'll just respond yeah. to you. You just don't interrupt me, I will respond. Okay. Uh, so what before, so in INSOC, which is European Association of Gas Operators, they do the stress testing all the time, kind of doom, doomsday scenarios that you discuss. And they do it kind of very kind of periodically and they discuss what if this happens and that happens and kind of Algeria and kind of no kind of supplies. So what was very remote risk opportunity before? Kind of large scale conflict kind of in Russia, they really haven't looked at it. So it was a remote risk opportunity or possibility. Now it is actually very, very big risk factor, and everybody is developing contingency risk kind of action plans. So and contingency action plans exist in every single European market. So every country has those contingency plans that uh, uh, have things like what industries would be shut down, non-essential industries, uh, in case there is a shutdown of, kind of say, gas kind of flow from different directions. So offices, for example, office buildings, they might say, well, we'll stop heating of office buildings. People might ask to turn thermostats two degrees down. So actually, there are pretty detailed scenarios that are described in every country what happens in those situations. And it's all very, very professionally done. We don't need to tell Germans what to do if Russian gas is cut off. They know. They have known for a while what happened. Yeah? So it's all kind of people kind of looking and analyzing this. There are a lot of experts involved in this. I think kind of from my perspective, the big question is how long European public will be able to look at the videos that they see on BBC, on CNN, seeing kind of death toll, seeing civilians being killed, and how long politicians will feel that they don't have political support to start taking measures. Yeah, yeah, um, I think that's um, essentially the question, uh, the question that I would like to, uh, to answer to myself, and I think I'm already uh, I'm beginning to, to have this answer, is we were told, Euro Europeans and Ukrainians and the whole world has been, have been told for decades that there is no alternative to Russian gas. So, no alternative because there is a pipeline, no alternative because there is no replacement. But what you're saying is the, essentially that plans exist and there are alternatives and Europe may not have a choice, which is I wanted to clarify what you meant. Europe, Europe might not have a choice but to live without Russian gas. So it's not that it doesn't have a choice but to live with Russian gas. It might have to live without. Yeah, so kind of like Putin tomorrow might say, you know, like in one of his kind of talks, and he might say, well, you know what, kind of like all this language that you have been using about this kind of, uh, I feel it as a threat, I'm cutting gas in Nord Stream 2, in Nord Stream 1. He might say this. He might decide that he will cut gas himself. It's very unlikely because it's a major contributor now to kind of cash flow. Yeah. Uh, and all these cash flows are actually going back into the kind of Russian kind of financial system and then they kind of finance those tanks that kill kind of those people in those cities, yeah? So we kind of understand this kind of financial flows. So he, he might kind of decide to cut gas, it's unlikely, and or Europeans might kind of decide, and I, I think it's also a very likely outcome. They see the death toll, they see it's coming closer to their borders, and they might decide, actually, you know what, we're not going to finance it. So it's our unilateral decision. We kind of uh, we're imposing sanctions on Nord Stream One. You have a view on Nord Stream One, right? Uh, well, I mean, the Nord Stream One, to be honest, wouldn't make a big difference if they closed down Nord Stream One. It wouldn't make a difference to Western Europe, not at all. I mean, the Western Europe, especially we're coming up to spring, demand is going to be low, um, and they can easily switch off Nord Stream One. I I don't think that there would be a problem. Maybe up until the heating season, when they would, so 1st of October, when they would have to consider alternative sources of supply. But there are, and, and this is absolutely phenomenal, because what we thought was going to be unthinkable, you know, like killing Nord Stream 2, which was Russia's pipeline, or rethinking the whole, the whole idea of green transition, because Europe will be banging on about the green transition to um, net zero emissions by 2050 and uh, removing the fossil fuels. 
we're now beginning to think, so if we want to switch off that Russian gas, what are we going to do? So already that we've, we've got an announcement from German companies saying we're going to bring in two LNG terminals. LNG, for those of you who don't know, is liquefied natural gas. And this gas is put on ships and then sent all over the world by ship. Um, and you know, for, for many, many years they've been trying to build these terminals in Germany. They were constantly shot down by rival companies that really, I mean, you know, Nord Stream proponents that didn't want to see um, these, these pipelines, uh, these, these terminals. Uh, and now we're, we're seeing it. Within a couple of days it's all happening. Um, so with Nord Stream 1, if there was a decision taken to shut, to, to, to switch off the gas on Nord Stream 1, I, personally I don't think it's going to make a big difference to, to us in Europe. Maybe the market would react because right now we have full flows of gas and even though we have gas coming through the, through the market, prices are at record level. So this is an indication that markets do not react to fundamental drivers, you know, through, through to, to the fact that there is a gas shortfall, which it isn't, but they simply react and panic um, for what might come. So the market would react if there was, if something would happen, if an announcement was made, even though the situation may not be as dire as we would think, the market would still panic, the price would shoot up even higher, and it would have a knock-on impact on, um, uh, on, on the current market, such as fertilizers, and that in turn would have a huge impact on food prices, and that's one of the biggest fears that we have. But in terms of switching it off, it can be done. My, my, my problem is with Eastern Europe and I'm, I'm really concerned about Eastern Europe because if the gas is switched off through Ukraine, um, Ukraine might, might face a problem, uh, especially under current circumstances yeah. where this market now operates in isolation and it might need gas in order to keep the lights on in hospitals, in uh, bomb shelters and so forth. So for me, that's my biggest fear. Uh, but as Karina said, and I think this is something that all of us can do, is turn down the heating by one degree. It will save you money, first of all. And you will also save Ukrainian lives. And um, it's also good for the environment. So turn down the heating by one degree in your homes. Put, put on an extra jumper. Can. So that's, uh, that's maybe um, a good thing to discuss now, what, what, uh, what can be done. So we discussed, the, um, and, and Karina said that panic is 2023, so we don't have It's to, not panic. It was not, it's not panic, but we have, there is time for European Union to, so it's not like the lights will start going out tomorrow and it will be apocalypse. No, there, is, there are systems in place, there are plans in place for any eventuality, and now the question is, of course, uh, Ukraine would be um, hit by such a scenario because it's buying its gas via, from Slovakia via the interconnector in, in Western Ukraine. So uh, not great if Russian gas disappears uh, in Europe for Ukraine, but for European Union... It's this is just an immediate <coughs> thing. So in the longer term, I'm sure that there will be big steps taken to reduce as much as possible. And in fact, again, the International <coughs> Energy Agency uh, said that there are about um, 15 billion cubic meters of gas, I believe, uh, that are um, included in contracts that various companies have. And these contracts are now coming up for renewal. So instead of, the IEA recommends that instead of these companies renewing their long-term contracts with Gazprom, they don't do it anymore. And that would cut uh, dependence on Russian gas by another 12%. So if you turn down the heating in your homes, that will save 10 billion cubic meters a year. And that's about 7% of what Russia sends to you. Oh, uh, another 12% another if, the, um, if the contracts are not renewed. So altogether about 20% reduction in Russian gas. Um, if more power plants, nuclear power plants, coal, term, coal uh, power plants are turned on for a very short period of time, because we are stuck, let's face it, um, until Europe moves more decisively towards renewables, um, then that will cut dependence on Russian gas even further. 
And then, of course, there are lots of voices that say, hey, we forgot about shale gas. UK, for example, has a lot had plans for shale gas. Poland, uh, Romania, Ukraine has a lot of shale gas, a lot of shale gas. Let's start, let's look at, let's look at it again. Uh, no, I think you're making very good questions. Just to remind everyone that uh, the, uh, it's very seasonal, right? So the demand yeah, so for gas is so, and kind of winter heating season is about kind of to end. So yeah. the, in spring, it would be kind of probably 60% of gas will be used just for primarily for industrial yeah. um, uh, consumers. So there will be no need to heat homes, etc. So already kind of that pressure, seasonal pressure wouldn't be there. So the, it's next winter. That's yes. why I'm telling you that people are caring about next winter and yes. winter afterwards. Yeah. Uh, so there's uh, there's a year to uh, uh, to think about that. And what should what should uh, uh, European countries do? I mean, uh, again, I, I think. Yeah. Uh, sorry, if I could just jump in here because um, I think you're, you're right to say that we're coming up to spring with no problem. But immediately, <coughs> right now, so the next few hours, the next few days are really, really, really crucial. And it's a question of balancing, <coughs> balancing against keeping the lights on in Ukraine and saving lives. If you see what I mean. So you know, what do we do with this gas? Because this gas, which contributes about a third, if not more, to to the Russian uh, budget um, and helps the Kremlin to fight to finance this war, yeah. um, we need to know what, what we're going to do with it. Um, do we cut it off completely? But then we can harm the. the you know, the Ukraine, and we, we, we weaken it even further, uh, or do we reduce it as much as possible and then uh, also save, save some lives? Um, I think it's a... It's but, a good, but you know what, I just got one thing I would like to throw back at you, and I'm just about to, like, I mean, this obsession about gas, and I understand it's a very kind of big subject. It's actually oil that is actually a lot more important as a subject, because oil contributes a lot more to the kind of Russian state budget, oil prices also increased two to three times in kind of the kind of conflict. So I think oil is actually more material even discussions than gas. And oil markets are a lot more flexible. So I think it's kind of oil is the subject that we really need to be talking about. Okay, you know what? Let's talk about oil. Okay, we've done gas, we established that gas can be switched off. So I did that that's the main thing I wanted to say. If some political leader of big country you know, it starts, starts with a G. Wants to shut it down, he, in this case, can do that. Physically, technically, there is a way, there is a plan. Okay, that can be done. So, gas, we've done gas. Um, oil. Oil, massive contributor to the Russian budget, as you said. That is something that the leaders of the world uh, are already under pressure to, to sanction and to stop buying. Um, we probably all read about Shell buying some Russian oil on discount and making a lot of money, and there is a lot of outrage because a lot of uh, a lot of uh, traders and countries stop buying Russian oil. Shell decided to buy some, so that's yeah. I don't know what was. But it's essentially what can you see kind of here. Yeah, it's you kind of gave really good examples. So essentially, like embargo and uh, I don't know, that hasn't been announced against kind of uh, Russian oil sector. But actually, traders, public, they're actually imposing their own sanctions. Shell kind of board members don't necessarily want to see their name in the press as being associated with blood money. And this is what yeah. I think pressure on international kind of uh, oil companies or traders would be even further. So as it's essentially kind of public is already voting with their kind of dollars that they're kind of like with their kind of filling stations, etc. And this is what, kind of, without even kind of U.S. kind of sanctions yeah. that could have been imposed, this is what already kind of is happening. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So 70 70 percent of, uh, of of the companies that we're buying are already self-sanctioning. So we we see a, a big impact on oil. In fact, the Russian euro uh, grade uh, crude is now at the 20 percent. Oh, sorry, 18 20 dollar discount to current uh, oil prices. What's the current price? So yeah, on Friday, I think it was around $109 per, per barrel, uh, which is a 14-year high. So you know, we already, we're already marching up on, on oil prices. 
Um, but, but of course, kind of there is always kind of like OPEC who can kind of is, always increase well, I mean, production, that, that's right? A, so that's it's another, a, that's another moderating in, price. That's another interesting story because for those of you who are following Iran, uh, you will probably have seen that the uh, the, the, the partners uh, were looking to <coughs> arrange a deal whereby Iran can start selling again oil to the market. Now, I was reading this morning that there were Russia, Russia, which was also historically involved in the negotiations of Iran's uh, nuclear program. Um, Russia was trying to um, to block the, the negotiations this morning. So Shocking! Getting... What a surprise! <laughs> it's it's an ongoing it's an ongoing story. So do keep an eye on Iran because it will have an impact on oil prices on Russia and ultimately on Ukraine. Yeah. Um, so the latest oil, <coughs> uh, which I see is slightly down, $115 per barrel, crude oil continuous contract, some sort of uh, such things. Um, so, but we have seen also a lot of uh, self-sanctioning or self or uh, people proactively not buying Russian oil. Um, the world can live without that, uh, clearly, but what is the... Uh, so it's not a question of whether we can live without Russian oil. That I do know the answer to. We can live without Russian oil. But what is the incremental impact? And when is the uh, economic impact is going to be felt? Is it also medium term or is it something? Like well, but I think what um, kind of fluctuation like this, yeah, when oil is so high, what happens then in the market, it kind of, you will be kind of suffering short term, but then kind of adoption of electric vehicles, etc. You know, this is where kind of your kind of reliance on petrol kind of gradually impacted or kind of significantly impacted. When you kind of you are sort of uh, thinking, well, me as a family, should I kind of buy kind of uh, electric vehicle? Well, this is kind of investment up front. But then you start sort of like comparing, well, if I have to fill it up with kind of petrol, and this is the price of electricity. So, you know, this is the kind of, the, the kind of price hikes like this, they really contribute to this kind of green transition. Uh, no, for sure. I mean, what, what we go through right now is definitely going to trigger a big revolution in the way that we as consumers will be behaving. I, I, I can easily imagine people now starting to switch from gas boilers to heat pumps, for example. Yeah, I, 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 I could heat pump okay. <laughs> easily because my boiler broke. <laughs> so I can see, yeah, it's good. <laughs> so we're going to see this yeah. transition and, and what's happening right now in Ukraine is it's <coughs> going to send ripples and shockwaves uh, throughout the world, not, not just immediate, imp immediate um, uh, effects like you know, high prices that you will all feel come from yes. the vehicle, uh, but also in the way that you will start behaving as consumers. So from the 24th of February 2022, the interest of peace in the world <coughs> and the interest of climate crisis activists essentially converged, right? So everything that is good for the planet is now going to be good for Ukraine and peace and security in Europe and the world. Well, as I said, turn the heating down by one yeah. degree and you say you hit so many birds with one stone. Right? It's interesting that all the climate change deniers allegedly, of course allegedly, reportedly, uh, are supported by sources that might or might not have been of Russian origin. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's accidental, but uh, certainly the development of, uh, of renewable energy uh, has been hit with disinformation and propaganda and a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of debates which probably hindered its, uh, its development. So for, for Europe, for the world <coughs> and the climate, and for Greta Thunberg, who is supporting Ukraine on Twitter very actively, it's good to switch off Russian oil, and it seems like it's Russian oil that is easiest for uh, leaders of the world to sanction officially rather than just uh, uh, people proactively stopping buying it to stop the, uh, this money going to, uh, to Russia's state Russia. budget, uh, which is, of course, the sooner Russia gets, runs out of money to finance its military, the sooner the, sooner the better. So is is it oil? Is it uh, the traditional? <coughs> well, I mean, with oil, as I said, we, we already see a big impact, and companies are shunning, uh, shunning the Russian oil, that's for sure. Um, and going forward, especially if there is more Iranian uh, oil coming to the market, I think uh, 
eventually there won't be any, any oil or any oil revenue for the Russians, so very little. Um, it's, it's gas that it's, um, it's difficult to replace immediately. And, and when I say difficult, I don't mean Western Europe, because I insist yeah. Western Europe is in a comfortable situation. There is no, I mean, there may, it may be felt, because obviously markets are connected, but um, ultimately it's Eastern Europe that I'm concerned, yeah. in particular Ukraine, because it, it could backfire against Ukraine. Uh, so, yes, there, there are concerns, of course, because uh, Bulgaria, Hungary, Poland, Slovakia, all of the countries that are uh, very supportive of Ukraine, that are receiving refugees, they are also relying on Russian gas and they don't have alternative supplies and it's probably difficult to build interconnectors very quickly. Um, but in terms of uh, stopping the flow of money, so, so that, that is a concern, I, agree. I don't know if we have an answer to that. Uh, <coughs> but in terms of stopping the financing of Russian military through the exports of energy, the easiest component to take out is oil. Or is there something else? I mean, there are kind of a lot of people um, analyzing kind of impacts of kind of sanctions. So, and there are kind of clearly views being taken on kind of various kind of sectoral sanctions. But kind of, um, I would say kind of oil pretty much kind of comes very high on that kind of list. But I'm also kind of um, arguing, so by the time they kind of make these sort of decisions, it might be market will be already making this decision for politicians. Mm, no, no, and I think it's also very often the moment kind of word embargo or something like this start being kind of mentioned by politicians, companies already start increasing their, well, uh, uh, insurance companies start increasing their risk premiums, uh, company, when they're pricing their contracts or making their commercial decisions, obviously they kind of take this into account because there is this market signals. So I think kind of market is already predicting that it might happen. Mm. What is the best uh, way forward um, let's say in the medium term, so uh, um, what does <coughs> Europe need to do, uh, apart from turning the uh, thermostat to degrees, um, to reduce this reliance longer term? Um, what about nuclear? What about coal? And I think German, 5% of German electricity comes from Russian coal. Um, I did not know this until recently, but it's coal as well that is coming out of Russia. Uh, which is bad for a number of reasons, but of course if you cut off gas, you need coal from somewhere. There's also, um, and there's also nuclear. Now, this, uh, the threat of nuclear Armageddon in Ukraine at the moment, which you, we all talked about, and you, you explained what happened there, uh, I think scared me of the idea of nuclear. If this conversation happened two weeks ago, I would say, yeah, let's build nuclear everywhere, small, because that will reduce the lives of Russian gas. Um, all of this news of the, of the last, um, Two weeks, Chernobyl still occupied, by the way, was the largest uh, storage of spent fuel. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure I want, to, I want to press that point, but is there a way to have uh, nuclear capacity across Europe, yeah, sure. or should we just focus on renewable energy for more uh, renewable energy? I think, I think it's just this let's, you know, it's kind of like, it's, these are all very long-term projects. Kind of, it's not kind of five minutes to build nuclear power station. They're like really quite long kind of to bring on street. And what you probably need to be thinking about is appropriate solutions for different kind of regions. And appropriate, so, and people started to look at it. So I, I think kind of Germany kind of is going to look at not kind of stopping mm -hmm. nuclear power stations that they were going to actually uh, kind of stop, right? They uh, stopped three in December. I'm just not, I didn't have time to research whether they can reverse that. They just stopped three. They were talking about, uh, or thinking, I mean, there, there were some calls on, on Germany to <coughs> bring back some of the nuclear power plants, as well as the thermal power plants, which have been stopped. Mm. Uh, but there are other solutions. I mean, there's, not, there's new technology that is coming online. It's, um, it's these small nuclear uh, modular reactors. So, you know, nuclear power plants traditionally have been quite big, with big reactors, big capacity. Um, but now there are companies such as Rolls-Royce, for example, or New Scale in the US, which are building the, uh, the smaller reactors. They are built in, in the US or here in the UK and then deployed wherever they are needed. Um, and assembled, let's say, Romania, for example, signed up for one, Poland, uh, 
And the capacity is much smaller, but um, they are quite flexible and could be easily used. Of course, it's a newer technology, so it hasn't been quite properly tested. Um, then there are other other there's other technology like battery um, electric battery storage you know, that, that could be used for renewables. But this, uh, as you say, this is very very long term. But, but I think it's also sort of like, yeah, you can't just say, well, let's do all solar. Kind of solar works in Spain and Portugal and Italy. Offshore wind works well in Denmark and in the UK. So yes. you really need to kind of be working with geographies that you have. And if you kind of don't have kind of ISIS that you need to be kind of thinking about sort of like uh, other things. But also, I just, I, I think I just kind of can't stress enough as well. And 2014 kind of, I think, kind of taught Europe something. So more interconnectors are built across Europe, more flexibility there is in the system, less vulnerability there is in the system. So that's, I think, Europe has done quite well in kind of investing in those interconnectors, yeah, and that's why... It has, but let's not forget that, um, and that, again, I come back to Eastern Europe, because this is the most vulnerable <coughs> part, is that, yes, Europe has invested in interconnectors, but some of the, <coughs> the local politicians or some of the local uh, companies in charge of these interconnectors have had have deep roots and are connected to Russia and to Gazprom. So you know the, the, this dependence. When we talk about Russian dependence, uh, Europe's dependence on Russian gas, we don't need to necessarily to think of, uh, about it in terms of too much Russian gas coming in. There are so many angles to it, like this enmeshment of various Russian interests inside Europe. You know, the, the Russian companies like Gazprom, like Rosneft, like Lukoil, like Novatec, uh, they have subsidiaries here. They work under shell, as shell companies. And it's very, very difficult to root them out. I mean, how do you know what they do? How do you, you know, are they bona fide or are they, yeah. do, they serve, do they serve Russian state interests? Are they state vehicles? Um, well, you don't at the moment in the UK. You don't, you don't know or you don't know the beneficial owners of any company. It can be anybody. Well, I mean, and this is this is everywhere. Well, and to be honest, I think it's probably kind of, if there will be kind of, a kind of positive side, a positive kind of outcome of what's happening now. And I know it's difficult to think about positives. It's kind of what we see in the news all the time. But actually, that kind of transparency of ownership and who in the end kind of benefits from some of this, I think kind of probing into kind of oligarchs and what kind of Europe has been doing with imposing sanctions. If this kind of trend continues and if this kind of conflict will continue, this trend will be really kind of going full kind of speed ahead. Then I think there will be really kind of greater transparency on kind of completely larger scale. Yes. yes. So um, I'm trying to, to see Alessia if she's here. Was, was there a Q&A? Uh, Q&A was part of the plan. Absolutely. OK, yeah. that, excellent. <coughs> so um, please uh, raise your hand, introduce yourself, and ask a question if, if you have one. Or um, yes, young man whose name is Mikola. <laughs> <laughs> yes, hi. Uh, so my question is directed to gas and oil. I have some statistics here. And the, Specifically, say that um, gas accounts for uh, two to five percent of Russian GDP, and oil is four and two five percent of Russian GDP. But well, Russian GDP again, sorry, forty-five or no, no, for, sorry, four to five, four to five, four five percent of Russian GDP. Yes, is oil, four five percent. No, two to five, two to five. Okay. Yes. So um, the question is, and it's related to um, to actually put in his cronies, right? Because they are they actually the beneficiaries from those companies directly. So if we tackle other companies and everything, um, it's not directly affecting Putin in his cronies. Whereas those, you know, gas and oil, that's not what, that wasn't really discussed. Um, what is what do you think in this response? Um, if you kind of cut or do the embargo of oil and gas, how is going to damage specifically Putin and his cronies? That's the first question. Okay, and while, while uh, the speakers answered that, could you please also look up how much of uh, oil and gas exports from Russia are part of its budget, of the expenditure that it spends? Okay, I can, the, tell, I can tell you specifically the, the revenue. Can, yeah, I Do think it's, the high, it, it's, it's high in terms of what they can spend, so uh, sanctioning oil and gas exports will hurt more than the most than 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 40%. So, sorry, so I'm, I'm going to tell you specifically. So, introducing gas embargo would result in an earned revenue of 30 to 75 billion of uh, USD dollars, 
uh, and that would result in 82 to 205 million daily. Yeah, so, well, I mean, since prices started increasing this month, uh, Russia gets about 660 million euros a day on what it sells. So you can do the yeah, math. I read the thing was New York Times is said that it's something like it's taken by new tank every 20 minutes. Right. So, yeah. like Cle that. clearly a source of revenue. Um, <coughs> uh, but the uh, is asking um, a good question. So, in terms of uh, uh, targeting directly uh, people closest to Putin and supporting his regime um, rather than just the yeah, economy. I mean, most of these companies are state companies. Gazprom, okay, it's listed. Uh, it's listed on the on, on, the, on the exchange, but. Most of it's, it's a state, it's a state company. So well, so it's a gas company, it's a state company, right? Because yeah. kind of Gazprom can only kind of export, right? So no, they can't export. So, uh, so but, uh, but, but the oil companies, yeah, you have you have oils, so you yeah, can yeah, have kind of uh, others, right? So it's uh, the kind of ownership structure is going to be a little bit different. Is Gazprom still listed on LSE? on the London Stock Exchange? Last I saw, there yeah. yeah. was a talk of suspension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, that is an interesting um, aspect. We have uh, a war in Ukraine, there's a lot of conversation about how to cut, uh, cut off the source of uh, this massive financial revenue to Russia, which finances this military. And in London, we still have a number of Russian energy companies, oil and gas companies, listed. Uh, I don't know, uh, is that normal? Should, it, should they be delisted immediately? Because of, I had an impression from what the Prime Minister was saying that this is going to happen. I think they they delisted them. I think no, they 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 it's like their trading is suspended, right? Because when there is sort of like volatility yeah. like this, trading typically suspended. So I think quite a few, I think Polyus as well, old company, I think kind of trading was suspended for that. So I think kind of Luke Oil kind of shares as well. I mean, I haven't looked at the... That's kind of from Luke Oil. I think, I think they were kicked out, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, maybe. You can't trade. You cannot trade. You can't trade Russian shares, right? Okay, it so doesn't matter they're listed or not listed. You can list them on the wall here. So. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I was just wondering symbolically. <coughs> okay, they, they they cannot trade, but they uh, they still there. So what about clearing houses and uh, and other exchanges? Uh, to, uh, a day ago, Ukrainian Ministry of Energy issued a call yes, to uh, to the whole world and friends of yeah, Ukraine yeah, everywhere. Yeah, yeah. They asked yeah. all the clearing houses, trading venues like exchanges or brokerage firms to uh, ban uh, to ban these uh, Russian or Russian affiliated companies um, on exchanges. Um, so how is that going to help? Is that going to be a significant, so let's say a Russian company, let's say uh, Luke Oil or somebody or, uh, mm -hmm. or Rosneft, is denied access to these financial uh, centers, these hubs to do Fairly right. specific to technical transactions there to clear currency, I imagine, to do something. How much of an impact, if that were to be sanctioned, would that have on the... Uh, well, they would be cut off some, some revenue, right? I mean, they, they would not be able to trade on these exchanges and they would not have uh, a stream of revenue. Well, well, then, but exchange, it's only kind of trading on exchange. So there are minority shareholders and kind of there are some like majority shareholders in some of these companies, right? So kind of trading on exchange is just only give indication of the value of the company. Yeah, because no, but well, we're talking uh, oil and gas trade. Yeah. Oh no, you, you mean like actually kind of uh, yeah, buying yeah, 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 commodity exchange. Yeah, 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 you're not talking about share exchange. No, no, you're talking about commodity oil and gas traded uh, on exchanges. Um, yeah, we would cut off, cut them off from from. Uh, so they would need to do more kind of direct transactions rather than right. kind of yeah. trade. So if Western if Western exchanges keep this call and agree, so yes, let's say we cut off from uh, Russian oil and gas companies, from all the clearing houses, from the commodities exchanges, what does it mean in terms of uh, revenue to Russia? Uh, will they only have to sell all its oil and gas to China or can they still get this revenue? Is well, I think from what I know of, of Ural's blend, because kind of Russia has this high sulfur content blend that um, only kind of used uh, on kind of a handful kind of, of refiners. I think only kind of India and Thailand are other countries that have this type of refineries to work with this type of blend. So, uh, because it's high sulfur content. So if, if the West uh, sanctions Russian oil, India can keep buying it and sell refinery products and bypass sanctions that way. 
Well, I, I mean, kind of my experience of sanctions in general, when American sanctions are especially announced and knowing what fines have been levied before, uh, international or uh, international companies or companies that trade in dollars tend not to buy those because they are afraid of being fined by OFAC, which right. is the agency that. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it creates a lot of risk, both for uh, insurance companies, reinsurance companies, or anyone else. They they yeah, they <coughs> want to touch it with a badge pole. So sanctions. Very toxic. Right, so the official sanctions uh, of the sort that the Ukrainian Ministry of Energy is asking for are effective and are going to send ripples through the system, uh, even if Russia... What do you mean, like, they're not a kind of, or, or, well, some, some sanctions that were on, kind of already announced and published, they are kind of, of course, they're effective. Some su sanctions they have been announced but haven't been published mm -hmm. yet, yeah, so they're kind of going through the system, they're only kind of given as a sort of signal, but already they're kind of being priced in by market players in their decision process. Mm. But if sanctions are published, and kind of this kind of say, I don't know, like kind of one, you can say kind of some kind of individual, uh, kind of beneficial owner of the companies that come to me as a bank or insurance company for the contract, computer says no, it's right. automatic. And you can't kind of go anywhere. If they're not published, then it's a little bit kind of difficult because then kind of people trying to find their ways around, etc. Um, and, but if there is also indication kind of of sanctions, then it's obviously kind of going through compliance process, compliance departments and legal departments of all these big organizations. They really kind of pause and they probably steer in the side of the caution. That's kind of what happens. Well, great. Um, the, uh, you first, and then. Yes, thank you. Um, it's been all really informative. Um, I'm Hungarian myself, so. My question is going to be specific to Eastern Europe. So, two, two questions, essentially. Um, first of all, you've talked about how Western Europe is kind of fine with other Russian gas, but what's the case in Eastern Europe? So, the Hungarian government's narrative constantly is that um, Hungary is really reliant on Russian gas and we cannot um, afford to ourselves to, to cut that off. Uh, and the second question is, Dr. Sabotis, you've talked about this isolation of Ukraine from the, from the grid. Of Europe, and I'm doing really catch. I don't understand um, what is between us. Um, for example, Hungary, or Poland supplying Ukraine um, with European gas if it comes to the point that um, there is money out there. Thank you. What's your name? Uh, Matthias. Matthias, thank you for the uh, for coming to the discussion. So, who can uh, tackle or ask your expert on this in your country? <laughs> um, right. So on Hungary, Hungary currently receives gas, most of its gas, from uh, Russia via this new corridor called Turk Stream. Uh, initially it used to get it via Ukraine, but from 1st of October last year it was diverted, rerouted via Turk Stream 2, which comes from Russia, crosses the Black Sea, Turkey, Bulgaria, Serbia, and then Hungary. <coughs> now, it also gets gas from other sources, from Austria, for example, so there is an interconnection with Austria. Um, it also has some kind of swaps in place, and again, it's a very complicated issue. I'm not going to go too much in depth, but you can get some gas via the Serbian or in Croatia. So it has some sources of supply, but the bulk of it, obviously, is the Russian gas. Now, the question is, are the, are, are the Russians going to cut the gas on Turk Stream? Um, is Turk Stream likely to be operational? Let's not forget that there is a lot of naval activity in the Black Sea, and Turk Stream does go underneath the Black Sea, right? So it's, it's a subsea pipeline. We don't we don't know about the safety of this pipeline. Um, but if it is indeed um, cut off, then Hungary has a problem, of course has a problem. It may get some of this gas from, from, from the south. Some of the gas that could be brought in from Austria, assuming that there is gas going through Nord Stream 1 into Germany and then coming back in reverse from Germany, Austria and then Hungary, um, but would not be enough. Um, if there is gas <coughs> going through Ukraine, then of course the old route can kick in, kick back in, and there, there could be supplies coming in from Ukraine into Hungary. Now, um, you asked about uh, Ukraine getting the gas 
from Eastern Europe. And of course, Hungary has been of great help to Ukraine in, in recent years, um, flowing gas. And it was the first country that established what we call firm capacity. So it means that Ukraine actually can get physical, the physical molecule coming from Hungary back into uh, Ukraine. And um, your colleagues have yeah, done yeah. really well to increase the capacity, the, the physical import capacity. And right now Ukraine can import back into, into the country from Hungary, Slovakia and Poland about 50 million cubic meters of gas per day. But let's not forget that this is, it's, it's okay, it's very good, they've done really well, so congratulations to your colleagues. Um, but the, if you think, let, let me put it in context, the capacity to exit the gas from Ukraine to Europe, to these countries that I mentioned, <coughs> is about 200 million cubic meters. To bring it back into Ukraine is about 50 million. That's four times less. Um, um, in simple terms, what does it mean? I'm just trying to see the uh, connections, but it's... Uh, it's difficult without knowing. So if, let's say, Hungary needs to buy its gas from somewhere else, can it do that at, at the price of whatever? Can it, does it have a place to go and buy something that is not a Russian molecule? So the, 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 the not Russian molecule would be this LNG that comes from Croatia. Uh, so in case of big problems, there could be LNG brought into Croatia and then imported Croatia, so exported Croatia, Hungary. So LNG terminal, which is in the island uh, in the yeah, Kirk in the um, Adriatic, yeah. nice island. Yes. Um, I keep going there for holiday. Keep watching this uh, liquefied <laughs> natural gas terminal being built and thinking this is going to really come in handy one day. Yeah. So from that terminal where this uh, big tanker of liquid gas comes, they make it back into gassy gas, gasified, yeah. and that is yeah, that gasified gas can flow to to it Hungary. Can, yes. So there is a there is a Pipeline to yes, that. Yes. So yes. the question is, it's it's, not it's, a, it's a pain in the neck, and it's not. But it's not enough. Do you mean that the capacity of, of that uh, yes, the, uh, infrastructure is not enough to replace what uh, what comes from the other so side? So first of all, it's it's the, the terminal itself, which is obviously which can't cover the demand in Croatia and in Hungary and ultimately in Ukraine. Um, so I did it. There should be another one. In fact, I was reading that um, one of the companies, regional companies, a Hungarian uh, company, was calling for possibly a second terminal, uh, floating terminal in Croatia, which could ultimately help Ukraine. Uh, but it's also the capacity uh, um, along the way. So it's the transmission capacity, the pipelines that link. Croatia up to, to Ukraine for a long time. But I think we're probably just, I think while kind of, there are kind of clearly, re, this is just very helpful in order to understand regional points of view and who could be promoting certain viewpoints when kind of discussion is held at EU level or at this international level. Because every country would have their regional uh, peculiarities that are affected by exactly what Mora has been discussing. What I think is just really important to keep in mind though that physical infrastructure risk and environmental disaster infrastructure risk is incredibly getting really quite high. I mean, what we have been seeing in these nuclear power plants, explosions on kind of gas pipelines, all the kind of oil kind of uh, uh, storage facilities that have been blown, clearly kind of this Russian precision fighting in kind of uh, shooting at military facilities hasn't been very precise. If they have kind of keep hitting nuclear facilities, risk actually environmental risk to the region is very quite very high so i think everybody needs to uh, and russians including need to be focused on this issue because when people are kind of in war and they're starting kind of shooting at each other and they can hit nuclear power plant it's going to be damaging yeah. to russia it's going to be damaging incredibly damaging for the kind of whole region the, for the so, world for the world Karina, i think it's so uh, i think that's kind of uh, if we kind of wanted to kind of yeah. keep kind of important things in perspective this is really kind of an important point to keep in mind um well you can yes um i think what uh, what would be good is to understand like if uh, one of the uk voters present here went, went home and wanted <coughs> to write to his or her uh, member of parliament and ask for some sanctions what should they ask uh, because of, obviously 
that there's a question of can the UK protect Ukraine by providing an off-fly zone, by providing planes, by providing, ensuring that that stuff does not get uh, blown up because that will uh, create a catastrophe for the world. That's one thing. Um, we have the topic of the discussion was set as it was said, but uh, I think that would be, personally, I think that would be the best thing to do. However, what about the other aspect of sanctions? And I think that's, um, uh, that's another side. I think you um, asked another question about Ukraine's connection of Ukrainian electricity grid to, um, to the European <coughs> grid. Uh, so that's, uh, I think that's an interesting aspect which a lot of people uh, still know. You mentioned already that Ukraine disconnected from the Russian and Belarusian old Soviet grid. Um, luckily, several hours before the invasion, it's now isolated and it was planning to connect to the EU grid in the summer, if I don't uh, uh, mistake anything, after some more testing. So the system is already operating on the same frequency, or what's the technical term, as the EU system, which is not connected yet. Uh, how quickly can that be connected to stabilize Ukrainian grid? As it is, there's already yes. a political... No, the, this is, uh, I think, from my point of view, uh, I think this is more, or an even more concerning issue than, than the lack of gas. Um, because Ukraine right now, as I said, operates in this uh, isolated mode. And um, it's, it's a phenomenal job to try to keep this massive system, transmission system, at the 50 hertz fre frequency, uh, which is on, the, on par with, um, uh, with, with European countries. What people don't realize is that on top of that, Ukraine also does the whole thing for Moldova as well. Because Ukraine uncoupled, de uh, unplugged from the Belarusian <coughs> uh, Russian grid together with Moldova on the 24th of um, February. So they both operate in isolation mode. And if there is a problem in Moldova, poor Ukraine balances Moldova as well. I always thought that we, uh, Moldova and Ukraine, would be a regional uh, block of allies. They Probably they not in this absolute context. But uh, and um, <coughs> what is needed right now is that, and, and this organisation is called NSOE, so this is a, a European organisation of transmission system operators for electricity. It doesn't include just EU grids. It also includes uh, non-EU, like Turkey, for example. Um, but they said, okay, we are going to speed things up. That this NSOE synchronization was uh, due next year. Um, they said, we're going to speed things up, but they have to make sure that all the technical details are in place because if Ukraine is connected, then some of these plants go, the whole of Europe could, go, could enter a blackout, a massive blackout. Because th there are these... Um, imbalances in the system. So it's, it's you, you, you cannot, you, I'm sorry to stress this, but I, I'm in complete awe of, of the Ukrainian transmission yeah, uh, no, the guys electricity really of right, right, yeah. uh, If something happens, the tiniest thing, the whole, the whole of Europe could be a problem. Um, so, you know, hats off to them. They, they are doing a phenomenal job. Absolutely incredible. So yeah, we should stop buying Russian everything uh, as soon as we can to uh, support them. Uh, so you wanted to ask a question. Yeah, I it's, re you it's, it's related to the first part of so uh, the question that we just heard, um, but about another part of Europe. I mean, with in relation to Hungary, uh, Putin met Orban whenever it was about a month ago mm -hmm. and promised that there'd be no cutting off of oil supplies or gas supplies next year. Uh, who knows? All bets are off now, of course. But um, what I was thinking about, um, and it's partly because of family concerns for me, I'm about to go to Finland and I'm flying via Estonia, it was a long planned trip, um, but, and I'm still going to be going of course. But um, yesterday Putin made a statement where he said that uh, the imposition of sanctions was tantamount to an act of war, and we'd have to see whether or not they went ahead with it. These were his words, I mean roughly translated those were his words. Um, and it was a very vague threat, like, like his nuclear threat, we, we don't quite know what it means. But presumably what it means is that if the sanctions regime hardens, he's going to take a specific response to a specific area of NATO or the European Union. 
And it just occurred to me, because I was thinking about the flight to Estonia, and because I'm here, that actually an easy thing for him to do would be to turn off Nord Stream 1 to Estonia. And I understand what you've been saying, and it's been almost optimistic, not quite at all, but at least constructive about the idea that in one to two years' time there are things that we can do that will, um, that, that will fortify Europe uh, in energy terms against uh, those kind of threats. But in the next week, he may cut off supplies to Estonia. We have two energy terminals in Eastern Europe, one in Croatia and one in Greece. Why would Europe not invest in extra infrastructure? And oh, obviously, yes. That is a long <laughs> discussion that you just said. I think we, I think we need to have a special session. Uh, that, yeah, that that needs to be. Just, just very briefly, I want to reply to Luca because he's my, my, my dear colleague at work and uh, I, I would like to reply to him. So yes, on the first question whether the EU should be negotiating directly with Russia on gas contracts. It's a difficult one because we know that the Europe works along free market principles and doesn't have a state company that represents it. So there's many voices there. But we don't know. I mean, I suppose so it was like during kind of Cold War and stuff. I think it was more kind of uh, long term yes, kind of contracts. But, but this back happened in the kind of states. So. But, but, but let's not forget that free markets underpin the European Union. So it's, it's a difficult question. What, what we could see going forward, and here is where Ukraine could could play a huge role, would be to ensure, once the uh, reconstruction efforts of, of Ukraine start, is to ensure that Ukraine, thanks to its big storage facilities, becomes uh, or, or hosts uh, the strategic reserves of Europe. I mean, the Ukraine has the largest strategic, uh, the largest uh, storage facilities in Europe, 30 billion cubic meters, and it could host these, these facilities. I mean, I suppose it's sort of like uh, just on this point, I think there is this kind of discussion as well, kind of the role in reconstruction Ukraine can play in hydrogen, kind of trans exactly. kind of transition there, to there hydrogen. Are, there are many things. And kind of and, uh, or carbon capture, in fact, in some of those caverns as well, right? So it's, uh, as for yeah. Serbia and North Macedonia and uh, Bulgaria, but yes, they are very <coughs> much dependent on Russian gas. Uh, and cutting them off, Turk to stream gas, Russian gas, would be. It would be almost impossible for them. They would, they would be plunged into, into, <laughs> um, in cold, coldness and darkness. Um, uh, they are building actively uh, uh, interconnections in the uh, uh, electricity interconnections. So hopefully in coldness, but not into darkness at the short term. But I'm really mindful of the time. Yes. We we were sort of thinking that this this needs to uh, to finish after one hour, um, and uh, we talked for clearly longer than that, an hour and a half. Uh, thank you very much for coming, and uh, uh, just uh, a couple of sentences of summary. Um, uh, Karina mentioned that we could, whatever, whatever we decide here does not, uh, you know, does not mean that it will happen. Uh, but if it were up to the us in this room, we can say that we established that Europe can physically, technically, and financially even uh, cut off Russian gas, and no catastrophe will happen but impact on the markets will happen uh, clearly for, for gas and the cutting off of the gas would affect mostly Eastern uh, European countries which also supply molecules through other interconnections into Ukraine. Um, so, so gas is a complex issue. We also established that oil is much easier target for those who want to reduce Russian state's uh, income from Western democracies. Um, and it is already being targeted by many, so oil is something to think about in terms of uh, if you want to um, if you want to stop buying <coughs> Russian, Russian products. Um, we also, I think, all agree that uh, when the war is over and the uh, um, and Ukraine is EU member, uh, hopefully, hope, hopefully it get connected to the European grid before it becomes fully EU member, but so we connect to the grid by we I mean Ukraine. So Ukraine connects to the grid, becomes a EU member, becomes a European energy hub because of the uh, massive storage reserves in Western Ukraine. And then I, I like your focus on positive. That's really <laughs> <laughs> these dark days gives me this sort of like warm fuzzy feeling. <laughs> I, I think that, that that should be the plan. It, Ukraine is a reliable partner, has massive uh, gas storage in Western Ukraine, currently filled from uh, Eastern Europe. So clearly, we don't have an answer in the immediate to Eastern European connection to Russian gas. But we discussed that there's there's 
different ways to, uh, to, to strengthen that. Uh, but in the long term, like I said, in the long term, medium term, I can see Ukraine as a European energy player uh, on, on the level of the Meanwhile, uh, let's put another jumper on, turn off the thermostat, and uh, when the gas boiler goes down, we switch to renewables. And one, one final thing, if I may, sorry, we, we women were like talking, right? <laughs> sorry about this. Uh, but one more thing, um, if, I, I'm sure that you, know, you, you will be asked to donate, and, and uh, we, we hope that you will be able to support Ukraine in, in many different ways and choose a charity of your, a, you know, a donator charity of your choice. But if you think you can also add a few donations to the reconstruction of the uh, Ukrainian infrastructure, which really is damaged and requires support, uh, then please contact me. I will give you my contact details if you want. Come up to me and I will put you in touch with the Energy Community, which is uh, a, a European institution affiliated um, with the EU and working very closely with Ukraine. And they have set up a fund where you can donate um, to help with the rec reconstruction of the uh, Ukrainian um, so, um, interest. Yes, thank you. So the uh, reconstruction will be... That is a problem, yeah, not... Um, reconstruction will be, will be obviously a big effort and uh, good to hear that already uh, people are preparing for that stage. So Aura Sabado is an energy journalist and is, uh, also academic. And Terina Luchinkina, um, our good friend from everywhere, I know you as a former PwC um, senior uh, manager, senior director, but uh, uh, also with the obvious... Uh, I think my, my, my energy experience is primarily than being board director of Ukrainian gas pipelines. So. We will uh, turn those pipelines to set of peace in the world. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, this was the Ukrainian Institute London event, and thank you uh, for organizing it. Uh, thank you everyone. Just to say a huge thanks to the cathedral here um, for hosting us. They've been hosting us for quite a long time now because we don't have access to 79 Holland Park, the usual venue where we normally hold events, so thank you. Um, there's also tea and coffee for you uh, at the back, so please don't rush off if you can stay. Let's, let's talk amongst ourselves and to our speakers. And please follow us, follow Ukrainian Institute London on our social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, everywhere. And um, check our website. We've turned our homepage into the list of charities, ways to support Ukraine and also reliable information. So who you can read and follow and get actually reliable information on Ukraine. So follow us and um, stay in touch with us in the future and if you can, do support us. And I'd like, just like to thank this fantastic all-female um, knowledgeable <laughs> panel uh, for coming at such short notice. We decided to hold this event yesterday and here they are. And thanks uh, for coming at short, short notice as well. So Svetlana, Aura and Karina, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.